So, welcome everybody. Um, so, my name is Johnny Reese, and I'm the Head of Professional Development at CDM. I'm just going to share my screen with you and get the, uh, the PowerPoint up, and I hope there's no technical difficulty. So, welcome. Um, I've been in post with CDM nearly two months now. My background, in short, is I've taught uh, in the English FE sector for 14 years. My most recent role was at Newcastle College as Head of Teaching Learning and Assessment. Um, so, I was there from March... Uh, across the first lockdown period from March 2020 through to November 2020. So I'm, I'm very current, I like to think, in relation to uh, what is going on in, in teaching online and the flipped online delivery. So the purpose of this afternoon is really to have a brief chat around what the sector is like at this point in time and to really share my points of focus for yourself and for your lecturers around what I feel is really important within the current landscape but also to share quite a bit of work that we'll be doing in the next three or four months to support yourselves and support your colleagues um, with continuing to develop our practice when delivering online. Um, so I, I want to start with really an honest reflection on where we are. In the last 10 months, it really has been unprecedented. I say I've been involved in the sector for 14 years, never had anything like it. And, and I think a long time before that, there was nothing really ever like this. You know, so the flip to online delivery within a, a very short time period, it was really been unprecedented. And as we go through right across the plethora of college staff, they're doing a fantastic job. You know, there's a load of different barriers, a load of different hurdles that they're overcoming day by day to try and provide the best experience to our learners. You know, no matter whether learners are studying part-time, full-time, across different levels and so on and so forth. And we all know that, but it's really important to reflect and I guess to pause and re reflect on this. We've only been back five or six days after the Christmas break, and it feels like we've never been away. And again, our students are really fantastic. They're, they're, they're overcoming every challenge that they face, you know, and they become more and more resilient day by day. And again, there's a whole host of different challenges which we won't have time to go into this afternoon, but our students and our staff are doing a fantastic job. And when pulling this together, this is kind of how I, I perceive the current situation is. You know, so it's like trying to do a jigsaw. But every time you look at the lid, what we're trying to build changes. But actually, every time you look back in the box, the options that we've got available change too. Okay, so in terms of different ingredients, but what we're going to look at today is, is what are the fundamentals, what are the key bits of information that actually we should really pair back to and ensure that we deliver um, or we consider when delivering our practice. And the last point is our teaching or our delivering has been flipped on its head and everything we know has changed. And we'll come back to that a bit later on. Okay, because at first it feels like that, but when we start on picket, that may not be the case. Um, I came across this earlier on today, actually, and I thought this really resonates with a lot of the hard work that our, our lecturers are doing. You know, so kind of what external individuals see is the top bit, is, is what we deliver, but actually there's a heck of a lot of work going on behind the scenes. You know, so we know this, and there's a lot of fantastic work going on from our, from our colleagues to try and help what the student experience is to be excellent, that's never ending. And I remember a colleague said to me, well, 12 years when I first started teaching with the role of teaching, there's always something to do. Whereas actually that's, that's never been more pertinent than right now when we're trying to teach face-to-face, -face, we're trying to teach live online, asynchronous online, mark work, provide feedback, whereas look at different ingredients there as well. So again, I, I found that really interesting and, and something to consider. And I want to start with kind of what the research says. And this was something that was, was flying around in, in just after lockdown one um, from the Education Endowment Foundation, which uh, works with schools in England. But again, I think it's very relevant. So this bit, I think, is really interesting and something to consider. And the more you go through the delivery methods we are doing at the minute, that really resonates. So irrespective of the medium of delivery, pedagogy is still vitally important. And that's what the purpose of this, um, this virtual bridge is all about. And that's what the purpose of our future work at CDM for the next three, four months is, is really focusing on actually what are the fundamental aspects of pedagogy that we should really refine and focus on. And it's really challenging right now because, as I said at the start, we're in really unprecedented times. And in terms of research of, of online delivery, has been large parts within the um, higher education and university world, schools and colleges a lot less so. Okay, so there'll be a lot of learning through doing over the last nine months as well as the kind of six months ahead. 
Uh, and that course taken from a blog, which is linked in there. It's kind of really interesting. And a bit of research, again, I'll let you kind of read that. The key concepts found that actually the method of delivery, whether that be pre-recorded or live, really is quite in inconclusive. However, the quality of the implementation was a key factor. And you probably think, yeah, that's common sense. And I would totally agree. But again, with this being so new and our methods of delivery being very different to the norm, it's important to have this information to kind of fall back to it and, and, and to kind of really underpin what we do. And as I kind of shared earlier on, lockdown one, this bit of research came out, which kind of said there's really five key concepts to really focus on. The first one being what we just talked about there in terms of teaching quality is more important than how the lessons are delivered. Okay, I think we all agree with that. Number two, access to technology is key, especially for our disadvantaged students. However, the real challenge here is, is what can we control? And that's a difficulty. We can't magic up X amount of laptops or X amount of broadband or, or connectivity within certain areas. But it's a factor. You know, I think we all appreciate it. it's a very real significant factor. And I'll come back to this later on, but the key bit here is knowing your students, is knowing your cohorts, who has what, who doesn't have what, and then, then trying to provide a solution that is aligned the best fit or, or kind of meets all needs. But again, not easy. Peer interactions can provide motivation and improve learning outcomes. Again, you probably think common sense, but it's really important that we kind of come back to these and we incorporate these within our delivery. And that's both for our staff and our students. You know, there's been a lot of work done over the last nine months in relation to mental health and staff well-being and the importance and the power of connection. And one aspect of this that kind of really resonated with me um, back my former role was it's really hard for teachers and lecturers right now because they're not getting that positive reinforcement from their students. Often they're talking at a screen and seeing four or five tiles and they're not getting the, the kind of praise and the visual cues and the verbal cues that they would typically get from their learners. You know, so that's really tough for a teacher. And then in the same breath, that's particularly difficult for students as well. So it's about trying to build opportunities where we can provide peer interactions. Interestingly, but again, equally obviously, supporting our students to really work independently can improve their learning outcomes. You know, so self-regulation and aspects of that is a fundamental element. And then finally, different approaches to remote learning suit different types of content and different types of students. So you're probably looking at these now and thinking, yeah, that's nothing new. But I think often it's easy to, to look back and reflect and forget some of these, because I know, especially in my world and in lockdown one, we tried to replicate the face-to-face -face timetable online because of in the college, that's how we were paid uh, by hours and by time. And actually some of these weren't as pertinent as they would be right now, nine months in or 10 months in. Okay, so it's a bit of context. And that's where the research came from. So again, we'll, we'll circulate these after the session. So you have a look, you have a look at links and spend a bit of time reading through these. And then back the statement I kind of shared at the start. So in terms of our teaching has been flipped on its head and everything we know has changed. But has it? And I think now we are all nine or 10 months in, I think we'll probably disagree with that statement quite a bit. In my former role, I'm going to say it's for the last time, I was working across a big college with 450 teachers across different provision types in terms of higher education, in terms of adult education, in terms of apprenticeships, in terms of our further education, our course study programmes. The way that I approach it and the way I, I kind of like to think is with my sporting background, 442, really simple. Let's go back to basics. You know, so what are the fundamentals and the core practice that we should really be focusing on? Once you get these right, then you add the flair and you add in the false, the false nine or the Steve Bruce, my, my Newcastle United manager last night, talk about two false tens. Anyway, let's not go there. But really, it's back to basics, you know, belt and braces and so on and so forth. But then you ask, well, what are the fundamentals of that? And again, these are my views on, on kind of aspects of pedagogy that really we should be focusing on within our face-to-face, our, -face, our synchronous, our asynchronous learning. And really, I'd encourage lecturers and encourage managers to really consider these six aspects to be at the forefront when planning or when engaging learners in remote or online education. Now, what I'll say is a little caveat before going into these. This might not necessarily be within every session, within every block of learning. You know, it all depends on what's being taught, the cohort of learners, the technology, the, the barriers, and so on and so forth. So these things might not be incorporated within every session, 
but within a period of time. And as I said at the start, we'll be doing a fair bit of work in the coming months looking at these, looking at how these are done or looking at how these can be done within the current climate with different subject areas there as well. First one, assessment for learning. I'm going to say from my experience of working with lecturers, this is often either taken for granted or is done, but maybe is not with as much conscious effort as possible. And for me, the, the two key aspects there are within those, those prompts afterwards. So how will you know what the students either already know or have learned? And then what? So again, it was my experience. Quizzes were fantastic. Yeah, great. I'm going to quiz. I'm going to do a group. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that and the other. So what? Then what are you going to do with that information? You know the gaps in knowledge. It's then about providing relevant material and support and that information to be um, further developed and supported and improved. But assessment for learning is vitally important for our lecturers to really focus on. And the great thing about the shift in the last 10 months is it's really highlighted some different tools that are out there pretty easily. That can be self-marking quizzes. That can be part of a effective practice to really support lecturers to do this with learners or even for learners to do this and take ownership over. But assessment for learning is a, a really vital point that should be considered when planning and engaging learners within the setting. Which ties in subtly with ret retrieval practice. So again, those of you that um, are kind of big up on the education research, it, it's been around for a long, long time, but it's kind of really come back to being really popular, so to speak, over the last 12, 18, 24 months. Again, quizzes, but the real purpose is it's about drawing back those different bits of information to enable and support learners to master that knowledge, to master their skills. And again, to retrieve that information, build those links, and to effectively understand them. So again, the bits of work are really for our lecturers to consider how are you doing this? And then thinking back to last week, last month, two months ago, how was that information link? Because then that, that continues to allow and support our learners to really master and develop that understanding. Touched upon this one earlier on, you know, effective relationships have never ever been more important, I believe, than right now. You know, whether that be for well-being, whether that should be for engagement, behavior management, so on and so forth. You know, so relationships, it's really tough right now. I've started a role two months ago. I've not met any of my colleagues face to face. I've not been up the head office. I've not met my employer, technically, apart from via a webcam and a, and a phone conversation, so on and so forth. However, it's really important that within what we're doing with our learners, that we build those relationships. So again, typically how we would have taught a, a 60 or 80 minute session is different now. However, it's still vitally important that we as a sector, we, we build space to do this and we, we work with our lecturers to how they may well do this. And again, that's both with students and with colleagues. Okay, so vitally important again, as we have a bit of work this week coming out about that. More than the explanation, sorry, um, really comes back to effective communication and around our lecturers modeling that information for our students, especially within this circumstance and this situation. Okay, I think nothing has been exacerbated more than effective communication and its importance. And again, there's a lot of information out there about or advice or guidance about how to share information with students, how to structure content, how to structure lessons or activities and so on and so forth and what the best ways of doing that. And again, what I'll say with all these there's no set way of doing it, absolutely not. But these are important concepts for our lectures to be mindful of and to consider um, when working with learners. And as I, what I will say is there's no magic answer, there's no magic bullet here because it, it all depends on our, our lectures, it all depends on our students, it all depends on the barriers. But it's a really vital point to really consider because, again, it, there's obviously a lot of research out there around expert explanation, around really explicit instruction aids learning. And questioning. So you might think, well, this ties in assessment for learning. It's a, it's a cop out. It ties in with a fewer practice. It does. However, from my experience, it is the most common method of checking and understanding. However, quite often or too often, it's ineffective or ineffective in comparison to what it could do. And it's an easy way. It's lazy sometimes. Often it's unplanned. So again, my message always is for lecturers, questions a fantastic tool, but it's got to be planned. Think about the why, think about the how. And again, within this current climate, cold calling is a, a great tool, which from my experience, when I saw a lot of teaching, uh, like I say, pre-November, 
was underutilized, and that might well just be my organization, but I know from speaking to different colleagues from different colleges, it's still not there as well. But again, it comes back to why and the how. And again, it, often these are interlinked because for question to be effective, you've got to have that first one there in terms of effective relationships. Again, it can link back to a trio practice. It can link back to assessment for learning. There's a lot of different interlinking here, but these are all fundamental aspects in their own right, which will support us and support our learners to make sufficient progress to develop their knowledge, to develop their skills and achieve their qualifications. And finally, bit, feedback. I've seen some fantastic examples of, of, of feedback, efficient feedback provided by Microsoft Forms or, or the assignments feature within Teams or, or many different methods there as well. Again, there's no set way, but now again, more than ever, feedback is really critical. But it's been really refreshing to see over the last 10 months, the, the shift in the appetite, pardon me, to recognize how digital technology, technologies can support more efficient working. So for example, verbal feedback, you know, I think a lot more lecturers now are, are a lot more willing than they were 10 months ago to record their voice quite simply for a minute, provide some feedback and, and away you go. And again, for our students. So there's a lot of work to be done here, but just jumping back to the initial point of this whole episode is when thinking about our learning, when thinking about structuring our learning, these are important concepts to think actually how am I going to do it? And it's not necessarily about writing about how we go do it, but going through that process of thinking, right? Well, why am I doing what am I doing? And then how are these elements embedded? And then why am I using these aspects and what will the outcome be? And I appreciate these aren't easy. Okay. And, and again, from my own experience, I had three or four consistent methods I used of some of these different aspects, which worked for me. And a big part of the work that we're doing, which we'll touch upon shortly, is we've been trying to kind of work across the sector, in particular, the next three or four months to share. And that's okay, but share different ideas that different people are using as how they're overcoming these barriers, because there is no set way. It all depends. And the final points before I move on. It's easier said than done, but it's really important. Know your learners. And I know lecturers bend over backwards and try and find out as much as they can about their students. But it's really, really important when structuring our learning, when doing different elements, that we know our learners. Keep it simple. Especially, again, in this current landscape. I've seen a lot of lecturers burn themselves out, trying to provide really high quality materials. It's been fantastic, but it's been too much. We can't do as much online in an hour and a half as we can face-to-face -face in an hour and a half, or we can't do it in the same way. We kind of make more bite size and break it up which takes up the next bit in terms of starting small. So go back to the 442 analogy, keep it really simple. You know, keep it consistent, make it work, and then you add a bit of flair from there. And again, that comes out consistency. And then finally, have a clear focus on, on kind of building and maintaining those effective relationships. And I, I kind of do apologize, but I don't in terms of I appreciate these are, are messages that you will already be aware of, you will be relaying. But one is quite often important to, to have this reassurance of that these are fundamentals that you are doing well and you're doing effectively. But it's also kind of sharing how different individuals are doing these different aspects, which takes us on nicely in terms of there's different bits of support on offer. And, and that's kind of what I kind of want to talk to you about now for the last couple of minutes. I'm, I'm just checking time, Kenji, I'm good. So CDM. Communication went out yesterday in relation to this. We had a lot of conversations with colleges prior to Christmas. Uh, and I appreciate this has been a need pre-pandemic as well. But we've, we're offering some subject-specific groups for lecturers, which will be online. We'll meet every four to six weeks, and they'll be starting at the end of January. So again, if you haven't seen those already, within this PowerPoint, there's a link to those. So there are 12 curriculum areas identified within there, which will be a space for lecturers in those curriculum areas to come together purposely to share ideas, share barriers, to share issues that they have had with a view of, look, this is what I've done. This is what I've over, what, how I have overcome it. So again, purpose of that is to build that network, build that community, and encourage that dialogue and conversation for that to take place. And there's been a really, really positive uptake so far. So within 24 hours, we've had about 170 applications or, or people declaring interest within those, which is fantastic. We've had some people asking for, for areas that aren't on that list. So again, we'll be looking at those and kind of how we can try and explore some support for those moving forward. But fundamentally, initially, 
this is just to provide a space for, for lecturers to share some ideas across colleges with people within their subject capacity around how they're overcoming or how they're, they're approaching the current situation. And the second bit, which I'm, I'm really excited about, is a series of podcasts. So again, the purpose of these, first and foremost, was to get people away from their desk. We'll be encouraging, and I'm sure every college is, people to get some fresh air, get some walks, or do whatever exercise you can do within Sinatra Sturgeon's guidance. But a series of short podcasts focus on a aspect of pedagogy. So for example, um, retrieval practice, what is it? Well, what we're trying to be looking to do here is, is really summarise the evidence and the research in layman's terms, really simplify it, and I mean that in the best way possible, with a range of different strategies and have a real conversation to try and encourage the average lecturer to be using this type of language within their daily practice. And that's okay because I know from my experience within, again, my former colleges, language like retrieval practice and so on and so forth, there was only a certain uh, proportion of staff really utilising or engaging having an understanding. So we're just trying to raise awareness, really. So within this, we'll be kind of conversing with, with different individuals from the Scottish sector, the English sector, talking about what we've learned in lockdown and delivering online and actually try to share some, some snippets of great practice. But as I said, the key bit there is 15, 20 minutes, they'll be in the year. When you're going for a walk or if you get some fresh air, there's a little snippet of, 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 of pedagogy podcast for you to kind of listen to and understand. And the first one of these will launch next Wednesday. Okay, and the other good thing is you won't see my face on a video, which is fantastic. Um, but they'll be launching initially fortnightly, possibly weekly, especially over the, the next couple of months. And what I'll be keen also to hear is any topics that you want to find out more about, or if you've got something really great to share, absolutely get in touch. Because what we want to try and do is, is create a cult or continue to create a culture around pedagogy actually mattering. And that's not saying it doesn't, and that's a nice little segue into the, the name of the title, but real snippets of what does it mean? But what does it mean for me as a lecturer? Whether I'm teaching construction, hair and beauty, sport, travel and tourism, or whatever, what does that mean? And then finally, last, there's loads and loads and loads of reading out there. You know, sometimes too much, but I think it's useful to share some different elements. Obviously, there's, there's two key links that Education Scotland and, and some, some resources provided over the last 10 months um, from Education Scotland colleagues, which is great. There was, I'm sure a lot of you will be part of uh, Twitter and social media. And again, it's some really interesting collaboration sharing of ideas there. So our third link is some different ideas from lecturers about how they are tackling this. Uh, there's a brand new course which launched earlier this week from, on Future Learn, how to teach online. So again, it's a, it's a short online course uh, for lecturers or individuals to work through. So again, it's a useful link and to try and get a different perspective. And then finally, one journal I came across earlier on, which was, was around how to try and encourage online learning to be a socially meaningful experience. But what I will say is, I'm not that saying that these are the only five bits. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of fantastic information out there. And really, for me, a big part of what I've learned on lockdown is, is the term perspective. You know, so it's really important that we encourage others to look through different lenses. You know, because often we, we work our own way for so long and teaching is quite a, quite a lonely profession because you're standing by yourself, typically delivering by yourself to a cohort of learners for 800 or more hours a year and getting very little feedback often. And it's, it's been really refreshing to have a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue over the last 10 months around teaching and learning, getting feedback and, and kind of opening the door there as well. So that's me done. So Kenji, I think I'm good for time. So I'll do my little pause. Can we pause now? I don't want to take the screen off and get my pause. We, we have time for a few questions. Fantastic. If, so. if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask Johnny a question. Hi, Johnny, it's Christine. Will okay. the PowerPoint be circulated? Yes, that'll be circulated after the session. That's fantastic. Thank you. And lovely to see you. I can't know whether you can see me or not. No um, We use Teams, don't we? So, um, oh, there you go. I, can, I think I can do it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Christine. There we go. Still at work. Somebody else now. Thank you. And you know, I'm just looking back through the chat as well. There's been lots of great dialogue in the chat and some really interesting point. And, and, and someone's saying there about tests. There's been some great articles on tests um, earlier this week, all of this week and last week as well. Again, any other questions, by all means, give us a shout. 
Um, pedagogy then, have you seen any good articles around engagement, sustaining engagement for for students? So what, what we found is a lot of students find the self-discipline of just keeping up with work when their only interaction is kind of limited online and they're, they're distanced from their peers. Um, have you seen some interesting sort of aspects around curriculum design, the pedagogy, to sustain that engagement? Uh, I think it, it comes back to what the Quran's I said before, but knowing your learners. And what I mean by that is every cohort of learners are different, every level, every subject, every teacher interactions and what they're used to and their habits and their behaviours. So I think it, it all stems back to really engagements and relationships and, and building those routines with learners. So I think there's no, I'm going to use this term again, there's no necessary magic answer around how best to do that, but it's about knowing your learners, meeting their individual needs, and then providing the learning in a consistent manner that allows it. Obviously, bear in mind, obviously, college expectations and, and, and requirements there as well. You know, so that, that, what I mean by that is we can't necessarily change it to meet the, the individual needs of every group, but it's about providing some, some consistent information and consistent routines, and that will um, encourage that. But obviously, then knowing your learners allows you to check in with learners who are particularly quiet or who are particularly quiet and just don't want to show their face on cameras or don't want to talk on microphones. It's about them looking at alternative methods that allows you to capture the feedback from the masses there as well. I'm, I'm just going to bring James Short into the conversation because he has delivered um, some sessions on Virtual Bridge before, but I know he's a, a maths lecturer at Dundee and Angus uh, College. And, and I'd just be interested to find somebody who's a relatively new lecturer. How does pedagogy sort of, what place does pedagogy have in, in your experiences of learning and teaching up till now, James? So. Hi, yes. So I actually um, had a question, but well, I'll answer your question. <laughs> So what, was it, what place does pedagogy have in my experience in online learning? Is that, is that the right question I heard you say? Yep. Well, it's huge, but I think one of the things that was brought up was how um, it's the quality of our materials online which has a big impact uh, rather than the, the mode of teaching. So I think um, one of the expectations of students, one of the digital expectations is that um, the materials are relevant and useful for uh, what they're learning. So I think the way that we structure our courses based on how we can use our materials uh, has more of an impact than uh, on that overall experience. So for an example, um, when given, for example, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, making sure that it's relevant and they're able to access it and it's engaging enough uh, that you're not just reading over PowerPoint slide after slide, um, and so I found that trying to make it more engaging has helped that. But the question I had is one of the things that I was kind of worried about was how to create a community. Because I think one of the things is one of the, when students come to college normally, they're able to join communities and they're able to like, maybe they've got brothers and sisters who've come the year before and they hear from them, come to college, you make friends and you get that community. Now, a lot of my students, as somebody mentioned in the comments, they're not getting that. Maybe their only interaction is in my class for that week or for that day at least. So I'm interested in how, as a lecturer, can I help facilitate a community? Do I need to help train my students on how to use online tools effectively? Or is it, what's the research on that? Um, that's a really interesting point. That's a really interesting point. I, from my perspective of being in a college is, I think the community element is more so around the infrastructure within that college more broadly, you know, so in terms of what the different aspects of their qualification and kind of how that, that is made up there. Um, in terms of the research side of things, from my experience of kind of what I've seen at the minute, there's not a great deal out there around that because this is quite new, especially with college level learners. Let's say for, for universities who, and you know, Open University, who've been delivering a lot of online learning. I'm going to say that the, the makeup or the typical cohort of learners studying that level don't necessarily have the challenge or the barriers that our young people would do in the main. So I think it is really challenging. And it's about that consistency for you to build with your learners and providing their spaces for them to communi communicate and collaborate and, and aspects facilities like Microsoft Teams where there's different forums and different chat features there 
straight away actually is really interesting and really important compared to other VLEs I may have used in the past where that wasn't readily available. But yeah, it's a real challenge. And I think that's the type of questions and conversations we'll be sharing as part of these practice development groups for other colleges to share actually how you've done and what's worked well for you with your cohorts, what's worked well for you with your different learners. Because I'm a big believer, and I'm going to again share this analogy before, but kind of looking over the fence at other colleges and nicking their ideas in the best way, but really kind of sharing them and, and then making them fit yourself, but also giving you reassurance about the work that you're doing. Actually, that, that is great. And like I said, in some respects, we can only provide certain tools for our learners to engage with there as well. So and I've not really answered that. I, I kind of do apologise, but I think it's because this is still very new within the college sector of flipping learning online and, and 16, 19 or 16 to 24 year olds being online for learning a lot of the time is just such a new aspect and new element. And certainly something I'll be looking to do because obviously as part of the CDM we've, we've employed a research manager and, and we'll be kind of looking at and kind of speaking with the sector on what are our hot topics and, and what can we really try and explore to try and support us moving forward. Because I think what I will say is that hopefully come August 2021, who knows what happens with vaccines and so on and so forth, but we may have an opportunity to really reflect and pick and choose well, well what does our delivery look like then? It doesn't have to go back to how it was. What are the best bits of, of learning in the last 10 months that we can, we can take, use, refresh and kind of make part of our programme moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan. Totally thank agree. You. Grant, well, thank you very much, everybody. Hope that was really useful.